Uh, tonight's event is, uh, is, is very special uh, to a lot of people here um, in a number of ways. Um, tonight's event is not just another uh, colloquium talk. It's not just another departmental colloquium. It's, it's, a, it's an event that is the first event to launch the Baylor Center for Christian Philosophy. And if you Google that phrase, you can look at the website to get a better description of that and the details of that. But the bottom line is it brings together an interdisciplinary set of scholars from across the curricula in Baylor to work together towards a common end in deepening and broadening the understanding of the Christian Sophia, the Christian wisdom, the Philosophia of Christ. And uh, an individual who has been very influential on many people uh, at Baylor, especially in Baylor philosophy, is Alvin Plantinga. Um, Many of us have known him for years and been influenced by him directly, and every philosophy student at Baylor has been influenced by him indirectly, and he has had an enormous impact on the philosophical scene in America especially, but also globally. And um, uh, so one of the first things the Center for Christian Philosophy has done is put together an Alvin Plantinga Award for Excellence in Christian Philosophy. And joining us tonight is Dr. Stephen Weikstra, the first recipient of the Alvin Plantinga Award for Excellence in Christian Philosophy. Thank you. Um, the Center for Christian Philosophy is housed in the Baylor Institute for Studies in Religion, um, directed by Byron Johnson and Rodney Stark. And um, we've got some big announcements coming later in the year uh, for other, other events we're doing, so stay tuned for that. I'm especially happy to introduce Steve tonight because he has written for 30 years in a core area of my research. Um, religious epistemology, generally speaking, and especially issues concerning the problem of evil and also the problem of divine hiddenness. Um, Steve's work has been uh, a guiding light for me. He has been one of the chief defenders. His name is more associated than anybody else's with a position not well named. It's called skeptical theism. And the basic idea is that one has a healthy skepticism about what we can predict about what God would do. So it sounds really common sense, but then it gets persistified in lots of different ways. And I've actually spent a lot of my career arguing against skeptical theism. But that doesn't mean that I haven't been inspired in those thoughts by interacting with Steve's work and those of other skeptical theists. And the interesting thing about Steve's work in skeptical theism is it has, he's continued to develop it and broaden it and deepen it over the years. He didn't just drop this view and then walk away from it. Um, he, the view has developed considerably over the years. And recently uh, I edited a volume on divine hiddenness and I, sp I specifically asked uh, Steve to contribute and even asked him, I said, would you please, there, people don't think that your position can be adapted to apply to a certain version of the problem of evil, of, of evil that's formulated in terms of Bayesian probability. Can you write me something that, that, that addresses this question? And because this, that's one of the great things about getting to edit books, like I really want to read this paper that hasn't been written yet so I can commission this paper and get to read it. And Steve's contribution turned out to be really the central contribution of the book in many ways. Just an absolutely um, uh, new work, and, and along with his co-author, Tim Perrine. Um, and so, so having said those personal words, I want to read the official introductory material so that you know some, uh, some facts about Dr. Weikstra, Dr. Weikstra. So, after earning dual degrees in physics and philosophy at Hope College, he went on to do a PhD in the renowned History and Philosophy of Science program at the University of Pittsburgh. He has been a National Science Foundation Fellow, Visiting Research Fellow at the Center for Philosophy of Science, a National Endowment for the Humanities Fellow, an SCR Fellow at Oriel College, Oxford, a Senior Fellow at the Notre Dame Center for Philosophy and Religion, and last year was the Plantica Fellow there. He's been a central contributor to the academic discussion of the problem of evil for the last 30 years, and he has retired this last year from 31 years of service at the philosophy department at Calvin College, where for eight years he was a colleague of our own uh, Dr. C. Stephen Evans, who is um, the executive director of the Baylor Center for Christian Philosophy. 
In his retirement, he is deepening and broadening uh, many of the themes he's explored throughout his career. And tonight is a, is a wonderful instance of his doing that thing. Please welcome Dr. Weikstra. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Trent, and thank you, Baylor. When Trent called me uh, two or three months ago and told me what he had in mind, uh, asked me if I'd come out and give a talk, I said yes. I somehow uh, missed that I was getting some award, the Alvin Plantigo Award. I'm just, uh, when I did finally get that, I said, I'm just touched. It means a lot to me, uh, Trent. And it does mean a lot to me. Uh, I retired from Calvin in May of uh, 2016, last year. And a month later, went to my doctor, and he said, we've got to get your heart tested. And I did, and he said, the cardiologist said, you need a new aortic valve really fast. Uh, so two months later, I was uh, under the surgeon's knife, got my hood open, got a new aortic valve. About the same time, I misplaced my computer as I was waiting for that, and I thought, uh, I didn't have it really backed up. I thought, you know, God must have some, something drastic in mind for me here. Maybe I'm time to set philosophy aside. Um, but I got a great surgery. I'm now doing treadmill every day. can run up to eight miles an hour. Uh, and I'm doing philosophy again. And this award, uh, you know, when I think of how could they give me an award for Christian excellence in, in, in Christian philosophy, I can only think of like George W. Bush before Yale, you know, who there's so many philosophers who have been far more productive than I have. And Bush W. said, uh, you who have gotten um, awards and certificates, I congratulate you. Uh, you see, students, uh, you too can be president. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. Um, I won't turn it down. You may want to take it back after this talk, though. <laughs> so uh, Plantinga has been an important influence on us all. Um, and um, just as you've spent your life fighting my skeptical theism, I have to say, uh, much of my career has been uh, arguing against Alvin Plantinga. So, uh, and especially on the issues I'm going to talk about tonight. Uh, I propose to talk tonight about some models, um, and I mean epistemic models, models uh, uh, telling a story about how we know things. But I want to begin quickly just with another model that could be a model of sorts for your Calvin Center, your Baylor Center for Christian Philosophy. And that's, uh, something that happened in the 1979-80 year at Calvin College when Calvin, uh, the Calvin Center for Christian Studies uh, pro um, sponsored a group of thinkers to work on a topic toward a reformed view of faith and reason. And they sponsored a team and it had a handful of philosophers, a physicist, a theologian, a historian, and three or so, so students. And they worked together on this, this topic toward a reformed view of faith and reason. Uh, the team was headed by Al Plandiga, Nick Walterstorff, and Bill Alston. Each of those had already distinguished themselves by work in areas outside of philosophy of religion, which was at that time a rather isolated backwater within the currents of mainstream philosophy. Um, and each, in different ways, each of these men utilized those currents of mainstream philosophy to, as it were, guide and power their shared work on this topic. In working toward a reformed view, the team soon came to focus their attention on, as they called it, the evidentialist's challenge to theistic belief. We can perhaps best see this challenge as arising from a question. Call it the evidentialist question. Is there enough evidence that God exists to make belief in God a reasonable belief rather than an unreasonable belief? And if so, is there enough to enable such belief to be a matter of knowledge that God exists? To this question, both parts, the evidentialist challenge 
answer is just this, no. As Bertrand Russell famously said, he'd tell God if asked at the pearly gates why he didn't believe, quote, not enough evidence, God, not enough evidence. The work of that CCS team found its first expression in the 1983 volume, Faith and Rationality, Reason and Belief in God. As Walter Storff explained in its introduction, that book is in part an effort to work out philosophically an anti-evidentialist impulse characteristic of reformed theology, by which he means theology going back to John Calvin, an impulse going back to Calvin that regards evidence or arguments as unnecessary for putting someone, quote, in a position of being within his epistemic rights and being a Christian. What the CCS team did was to bring into first philosophical light a supposition lurking beneath the evidentialist question, the supposition that inferential evidence or arguments are essential to theistic belief, if such belief is to be, in various senses, cognitively proper and above board. And they then, true to their adversarial Calvinistic impulses, found that supposition eminently contestable as Walter Storff put it in the page seven of that book. Uh, here's the book right here, the Faith and Rationality. It lacks a cover, it's well loved. He said, if I may be pardoned for a bit of overlay dramatic rhetoric, in these essays, the evidentialist challenge of the enlightenment is challenge and overcome. And what shall we now say about this? Two things, I think. On one hand, Walter Storff was, in a sense, surely right. Seldom within Christian philosophy have so few done so much. Within philosophy of religion, the work of that CCS team would stem the evidentialist tide, permanently altering the terms of the debate within philosophy of religion. And it would also, well beyond this, alter the landscape, if you will, the riverscape, of mainstream epistemology itself. It would give rise to a new branch in that river, the branch of reformed epistemology, epitomized not only in Plantinga's 1993 books, Warrant of the Current Debate and Warrant in Proper Function, but also Bill Alston's book, Perceiving God, and the many influential essays collected in his 1998 epistemic justification. Alston was an Episcopalian the one with deep charismatic roots, uh, as an Episcopalian, he may best be thought of as an honorary reformed thinker. The work of the 1979-80 CCS team gives, I suggest, one inspiration for what Baylor's new center of Christian philosophy may, God willing, be able to do. On the other hand, however, what about Walter Storff's overly dramatic rhetoric while reformed epistemology in its anti-evidentialism has challenged the evidentialist challenge, has it really overcome this challenge? Has it even fully understood it? Does an adversarial reformed anti-evidentialist against Bertrand Russell adequately address the real, the real evidentialist questions of our day? The answer is, if I may be pardoned a bit of overly dramatic rhetoric. <laughs> no. <laughs> Tonight I'll try to say why. So how more precisely have these reformed thinkers, the Calvinians I'll often call them, construed evidentialism? And what did they diagnose as wrong with it and offer as an alternative? What is it really to be an evidentialist about some belief? It is, in a word, to take that belief to need evidence. Okay, two words. To be an evidentialist about belief in God, therefore, is to take it that belief in God needs evidence. Two words. But now they open up all the philosophical work that needs to be done if we're to understand evidentialism. 
What sort of thing do we have in mind when we, uh, with evidence when we say theistic belief needs evidence? What sort of thing is this need for evidence? Who needs this evidence? Who needs to have it? Who needs to process it? And what do they need it for? Those are the questions that in attacking evidentialism and overcoming it, the reformed thinkers give one set of answers to. And as I struggled with their answers, seemed to me not to have fully engaged the evidentialism I thought needed to be engaged. So in some early essays in this topic, I distinguished the two. I called the form they were engaging extravagant evidentialism. I called the form I thought most needed to be expand, uh, attacked or addressed or come to grips with sensible evidentialism. Now, Walter Storff recently said philosophers need to tell more stories. So I'm going to interrupt my paper here, and this paper is 30 pages, but I won't be able to read it all, so some of the things in it I'm going to have to back up and just try to get on the table in a kind of big picture way. And a story is the best way, I think, to do this. Um, when I was in uh, elementary school, starting about third grade, I began to develop an interest in chemistry. I would ask my dad what things are made of. I'd look at a brick and say, Dad, what are bricks made of? And he'd say, clay. Show me some clay. And I could see, oh, you could turn clay into bricks. I said, what are windows made of? Glass. He said, sand. That was pretty remarkable. One day, I asked him, Dad, what's water made of? And he said, he only had an eighth grade education, by the way. He said, hydrogen and oxygen, two gases. That flabbergasted me. How could liquidy water be made of two gases, two airy type of, types of things? So around fifth grade, my teacher, Mrs. Billings, gave me books on chemistry, some really neat books, and I learned, huh, you can pass water from your train transformer through water and electricity through water and break water down into its two gases and collect it in little inverted test tubes, electrolysis of water. And I did that. I got used to the idea then that there are claims about certain fabulous realities, like that water is made of two gases, that you can't just tell are true by looking real hard at the water, but there are ways to tell that those things are true. By experiments, by reasoning from the results of experiments. In eighth grade, on my dad's 42nd birthday, we came home from church, and dad wasn't feeling well. Mom took him to the doctor's office, and he died there. She came back 30 minutes later and said, gathered us to her and said, children, your father is dead. Soon after that, I lost some of my interest in chemistry, and I can remember going up on our house roof in the country out of Martin and looking at the sky and thinking, is there a God behind this universe I see? And it seemed to me that claim was kind of like the claim water is made of two gases. It's a fabulous reality if it's true, but how could I know it's true? How could I tell it's true? As I looked at flowers and plants and stars, they're fabulous, but is there a personal being behind them? That seemed to me at the time to be the sort of claim that needed something in the way of evidence. When I, uh, I remember pestering in my church, my uh, youth catechism class and my minister for, well, what's the evidence? What are the reasons? And in Martin, Michigan, where I grew up, in the, in the Reformed Church, there was not really uh, um, much awareness of C.S. Lewis or anything like uh, William Lane Craig or Christian apologetics. The only book I could find in the church library was J.B. Phillips, nice little book, Your God is Too Small. 
nothing in the way of reflection uh, showing the reasoning behind Christian faith that might be given in favor of it. So in those years, I migrated over a year or two out of Christianity. I migrated into uh, uh, Eastern religions. This was 1965, 1966. I graduated 1967 in the summer of love. And at that time, people were saying, uh, you can experience divine reality directly uh, the way the yogis in Tibet did. But we now have shortcuts to it. Uh, so Timothy Leary was starting the League for Spiritual Discovery in uh, Manhattan. And I graduated and hitchhiked to Lower East Side in New York. And uh, one evening was standing outside on the sidewalk outside the League for Spiritual Discovery talking with uh, Tim Leary and, and uh, uh, Allen Ginsberg. That didn't really work out so well. <laughs> and I do not encourage that route. It took me when I went back to Hope College and dropped out and spent some time in Pine Rest, uh, getting some good counseling and finally finding my feet again. So um, there was a movie back then. I was a teenage werewolf. Um, I was a teenage evidentialist. Evidentialism has sort of been in my blood. But what does it mean? think uh, theism needs evidence. The first thing to say is uh, that little word needs, sometime we can use it to mean uh, lacks. For instance, if I look at Trent, uh, where is he? And say, Trent, I need a drink. I didn't mean water. Uh, it means I uh, have a certain deficiency. On the other hand, if I say we human beings need oxygen, uh, it doesn't mean there's any, any deficiency, it just means our health depends on having oxygen. And that's the sense in which theistic belief needs evidence, if you hold it needs evidence. It's in some sort of defective, deficient state if it doesn't have evidence. But uh, evidence of what sort? Um, needs by whom and for the sake of what? These are the questions the Calvin team in 1979-80 ex uh, explored at some length. And, and they came to an answer. So here, let me sketch the, the big picture of uh, their answer to that, this question, and then a big picture of uh, the answer um, I began sketching in the 1980s as I was reading their stuff. And once we have those big pictures in front of us, then we're going to, as time allows, we're actually going to turn to Al's reply and read sentences from his reply and talk about them. Well, I'll talk about them, but you can talk about them with me. So the answer that the Calvinians came on the question of belief that God exists, or we can call it for short, belief in God, is that belief that God exists does not need anything in the way of argumentation, it doesn't need anything in the way of what most precisely we might call inferential evidence, that human beings are made such that for some of them or some of us in our current state, we find ourselves with a strong disposition, looking at various things in the world to believe there's a God behind the world. Just as if Trent starts crying at the patheticness of this lecture, I look at the tears running down his face and I find a disposition to think, Trent is sad and disgusted. I don't go through any arguments or any inferences. This is a kind of instinctive belief forming process. And the Calvinians argued that belief based on that process can be perfectly reasonable, rational, and proper for human beings. It can be what they call a properly basic belief, like the belief that there are physical objects in the environment around me, or like the belief that other people manifesting certain physical behaviors have emotions. Those two are things that don't need anything in the way of argument or inference. There's a kind of natural belief-forming mechanism. 
Plantinga went on then to develop a model or a story about how this could be the case. Uh, he calls it the Aquinas-Calvin model. You could also call it the Alvinian-Calvinian model. For short, he calls it the AC model. And the AC model is a story. It's when you give a model in philosophy, you're free to sort of invent the story. You're not necessarily making a claim it's true. And the model says that God made human beings with a certain sense of divinity, a sensus divinitatis. And by that sense of divinitatis, human beings, when they're triggered by various aspects of the world around us, find within themselves, welling up, certain convictions that there is a divine reality behind or beyond or within this world, a belief in God, not a full-fledged theistic belief in God with all the attributes of God, but nevertheless the core of that belief in God. I'd like to read you a passage from Nicholas Waltersdorf's book, Lament for a Son, where Waltersdorf expresses how this divinitatis sense um, feels from the inside. Because the idea isn't that you have to know about a sense of divinitatis in order to be reasonable in having a belief based on it, any more than you need to know how your vision works in order to have a reasonable belief based on your vision. What it feels from like the inside is a belief welling up. So Waltersdorf writes, this book was written after the death of his son Eric in a mountain climbing accident, why don't you just scra scrap this God business, says one of my bitter suffering friends. It's a rotten world, you and I have been shafted, and that's that. Waltersdorf writes, I'm pinned down. When I survey this gigantic, intricate world, I cannot believe that it just came about. I do not mean that I have some good arguments for its being made and that I believe in the arguments. I mean that this conviction wells up irresistibly within me when I contemplate the world. The experiment of trying to abolish it does not work. When looking at the heavens, I cannot manage to believe that they do not declare the glory of God. When looking at the earth, I cannot bring off the attempt to believe that it does not display his handiwork. And then he says, and this is a segue into our next topic, I'll read all but a couple words of what he writes and bring those words in later. And when I read the New Testament, I am convinced that the man Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth was raised from the dead. In that, I see the sign that he was more than a prophet. He was the Son of God. So Walter Storff reads in the New Testament about the resurrection of Jesus and he finds welling up with himself the belief, yes, Jesus was raised from the dead. Now, in this book, a follow-up to that earlier work, Warranted Christian Belief, Plantinga addresses the question of the grounding of Christian belief, not just belief in God, but belief in the core claims of the Christian gospel. What uh, Plantinga calls the great claims of the gospel. Here, too, Plantinga has a model. He calls it the extended AC model, the extended uh, Aquinas Calvin model. And the model rests not on our sensus divinitatis, but another belief forming process, which he calls the internal instigation of the Holy Spirit. So the basic idea here is that God's Holy Spirit was at work in the production of Scripture, in the writing of Scripture by the scriptural authors, and that when Scripture is read or proclaimed, the Holy Spirit also works in the hearts of the hearers in appropriate circumstances, to produce conviction that the things being proclaimed are true. The generating of these beliefs, again, isn't an argument. It's not that the person hearing scripture has some theory about the Holy Spirit and forms the belief, 
oh, I am having an experience of the Holy Spirit somehow speaking into, uh, to me. This is true. And if the Holy Spirit's doing that, it's got to be true. So this is probably true. That would make the whole thing inferential. It would make it an argument. It's, again, the same phenomenology, the same inner character as Walter Storff has regarding the uh, uh, belief in God from creation. So here's the way Al puts it in Warranted Belief. When we read scripture or something presenting scriptural teaching or hear the gospel preached or are told of it by our parents, um, uh, or in some other way encounter a proclamation of the word, what is said simply seems right. It seems compelling. One finds oneself saying, yes, that's right. That's the truth of the matter. This is indeed the word of the Lord. I read, God was in Christ reconciling the word world to himself. I come to think, right, that's true. God really was in Christ reconciling the wor uh, world to himself. So it's a spontaneous arising of conviction. Um, one needn't have any idea about what the source of it is, but uh, on uh, the Calvinian understanding of rationality, when you have a rising of conviction, uh, a tendency to believe, those tendencies are innocent until proven guilty. They don't need necessarily inferential argument to support them. So that's, that's the one model. Now, in reading the Calvinian model, the area I found nagging me the most was, is this model adequate for beliefs about Jesus and about the resurrection? Um, when I became a Christian uh, through a slow process, um, I didn't, I asked Christ into my life, but I didn't immediately come to believe in the resurrection of Jesus. I under, was under the influence of Paul Tillich and Rudolf Boltmann. Um, I thought, ah, I think it's better to adopt a kind of symbolic interpretation of teachings about the resurrection. When I was 19, I spent a summer at a summer training camp in East Lansing under a guy named Tom Stark, and for the first time was exposed to a book by F.F. F. Bruce called The New Testament Documents, Are They, Reli Are they Reliable? It was eye-opening for me. I thought, wow, you can look at these New Testament documents in their historical context. You can think about how soon they were written after the death of Jesus. You can think about the type of communities they emerged in. And when you think about testimony, compare this testimony with other testimony, we routinely form beliefs about ancient history. It looks pretty good. That historical case, looking at the New Testament documents as historical testimony, created space for me to shift, to believe God really did rise Jesus, raise Jesus from the dead. And it seemed to me that for the Christian community, it was really important that there were people like F.F. F. Bruce writing books doing this. Did that mean that people who believed Jesus rose from the dead without reading F.F. F. Bruce are unreasonable or irrational. No, it doesn't mean that. So the first, there's, there's two kinds of linchpins in this shift to a more sensible evidentialism that I'm trying to work out. And the first one is that for many beliefs for which it is essential that we have evidence, if those beliefs are to be in good standing, what is essential is not that everybody believes the evidence on the basis of the, of the beliefs on the basis of that evidence, but that within the community there are those who process the evidence, process it adequately, and that 
for the whole community, our epistemic health, as it were, in holding the beliefs, rests upon that part of the community doing their work well. And this is, after all, the way it is with scientific beliefs as well. We hold beliefs about um, Jupiter being farther away than, than Saturn or the, the Earth going around the Sun. We would be hard-pressed ourselves, perhaps, to formulate the evidential case for that. It's not necessary that we do that for our beliefs to be in good epistemic standing. Uh, what is necessary is that um, we be part of a community in which the relevant members of the community have done that. So I called uh, this type of evidentialism communitarian evidentialism. It says that the, the various sorts of epistemic status that beliefs have depend upon the right parts of the community doing their job. Okay, now there's a second uh, key pivot point that seems to me essential as we try to think about what it would be to be a sensible evidentialist about things like the resurrection. And it's this. When Plandinga, in Warranted Christian Belief, is criticizing evidentialism about Jesus' resurrection, what he has in mind are thinkers like Richard Swinburne, who try to make belief in Jesus' resurrection depend upon a complex historical case requiring historical expertise by historical scholars that can give a adequate defense of Jesus' real resurrection from the dead. Plandinga does not want the, the, the warrant of our belief as Christians in the resurrection to rest upon the success or lack of success of a community, work of a community of scholars doing that. So he wants the, our confidence in the resurrection to arise supernaturally from a internal source, the internal instigation of the Holy Spirit. The distinction that seems to me uh, crucial to make in thinking our way to what a sensible evidentialism would look like is this. When Plantinga rejects the idea that the rationality or warrant of the resurrection depends on uh, the evidence of testimony or the evidence worked on by historians. He combines together two things, the professional work of historians and the ordinary sources of belief about the past that historians and all of us others rely on in forming beliefs about the past. I want to draw a line between those two things, the professional work of historians and the ordinary faculties that both historians and ordinary people use in forming beliefs about the past. For example, my grandfather, Henry Weikstra, somewhere around 1910, came from the Netherlands. He was working on the merchant marine, the Dutch merchant marine, in Hoboken, New Jersey. He jumped ship. He was going to become an American. He wandered to Michigan, paperless, to Michigan. Settled in Hopkins, Michigan, and my grandmother later came over and joined him. This story about Grandpa L. Frank jumping ship uh, was passed on to his nine children, including my mother, Vera. She passed it on to her children. I've already passed it on to my daughter, Stephanie, who's 35. So. Uh, who was in a position to know about this? Well, really, uh, Henry Weikstra was. He's the one who jumped ship. So here's an event that happened, Henry Weikstra jumping ship. Here's a person who was in a position to, to sort of know what happened. And then here's a long chain of testimonial transmission that eventually works its way to me. And I believe 
Grandpa jumped shut. Where are the historians, the professional historians? It's not a single one in sight. So far as I know, no professional historian or community of historians has ever sifted all the evidence and figured out if they could build a good historical case for that. If they did, they would, of course, have to do the same thing I did. They would have to rely on Henry's testimony and the chain of tes testimony from it, and they'd probably collect a lot of other evidence uh, as well. So the question then is, when we, as Christians, believe, and if you're not a Christian, just pretend for a minute, say, if I was a Christian, how would it go? since we're describing a model. When we as Christians believe Jesus rose from the dead, does the fact that there is a similar chain going back to people who claim to have witnessed Jesus' resurrection or the immediate aftermath of his resurrection and to have passed that perceptual knowledge on to the disciples and to the early Christian community. Is that testimonial chain playing a crucial, essential role in what gives our belief Jesus rose from the dead, the type of warrant, the type of reasonableness that it has? It seems to me it does. Here's a, I've never tried this out before. Here's a comparison I hope could be instructive. Um, we also find in the Gospels stories about the birth of Jesus, uh, the virgin birth. Suppose it turned out that the stories about the virgin birth and the things that happened to Mary uh, were written by the Apostle John, around 90 AD, that nobody had ever told him or passed on to him anything about the birth of Jesus. He'd never talked to Mary about it or Joseph, but he was sitting in his little monastic cell, maybe on Patmos. It came to him by the Holy Spirit. This is what happened. It was in a manger. And he wrote it down. And the Holy Spirit was inspiring those, that account. And then that same Holy Spirit, when we read the, the account, produces in us the conviction. Yes, that's what happened. That's one model of how the status of that belief could arise. <clears throat> Would that be a satisfying, satisfactory account of the epistemic status of that belief? On Plantinga's account, it would be. Because Plantinga says our conviction about the truth of descriptions of historical events in Scripture rest upon the Holy Spirit working in the writers of Scripture and then confirming it and sealing it unto our hearts when we read it. The other story, the other story, the other model you might tell is on the cross, Jesus looked at John and said, John, behold thy mother. Mother, behold thy son. John, I want you to take care of my mother. That John entered into the inner side circle of the family, became acquainted with these intimate stories about what happened, and through that, they became incorporate it into the gospel narratives. In that case, you have a, uh, uh, a chain of access to these historical events that links them to us. So, on Plantinga's account, the warrant and the rationality is independent of any questions about when the stories were written or by whom. It all rests on the Holy Spirit. On mine, it's not that the Holy Spirit is not involved, but that this ordinary source of knowledge, 
is intimately involved with the work of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so there's a passage I'd like to read. I stepped away from the mic. Could everybody, uh, you don't have that passage. I know you're, uh, and I, I said I'd uh, look through Plantinga's reply, and I'm thinking time is such. Uh, you'll just have to have me back some other time, Trent, for me to do that. Um, um, there's a passage, um, um, it's in the original essay, Not Done in a Corner, um, and it's by a Dutch theologian, Herman Ritterboss, which I took a lot of. Uh, Ritterboss has a slightly different context in mind, um, but I think it applies to this. Uh, it's, I, I, I wrote in 2002, and I still agree with this today. Uh, here, our model, the uh, uh, model I portrayed uh, as best I could, seeks an incarnational epistemology, invoking a reminder by Hermann Ritterboss, quote, the Spirit's witness in the scriptures takes place through the testimony of men. Rather than detracting from the character of the Spirit's witness, however, this points the way to a more precise determination of the quality of that witness. The fact that this human witness was taken up into the power and work of the Spirit and that the Spirit gave that witness the stamp of his authority in no way diminishes the fact that men, humans, were witnesses in a productive and receptive sense of God's great works in Jesus Christ. Not only did the Spirit inspire men to speak and write what they had received from him, but he caused them to speak and write what they, as witnesses, had seen and heard with their human eyes and ears. Therefore, the written witness of the whole New Testament does not lose its human character. This is so not only because it is expressed in human language and writing, but also because it is an eyewitness report and as such remains human, the fruit of a perception that was not infinite, and of a reproduction that did not exceed the limits of human comprehension and memory. Plantinga's extended AC model, taken together with his externalist theory of warrant, does help us see how God might have chosen to make the certainties of faith invulnerable to the, to the frailties of our ordinary access to the past. But if Ritterboss is right, God has chosen a different way, one by which the Holy Spirit, in guiding the production of the gospel narratives about Jesus and our reception of it today, fully takes up the human testimony of the human witnesses. If our best theology says God has chosen to work in this way, as it seems to me, then our best epistemological model will see the Spirit's inner testimonium as working in synergy with the ordinary evidential means by which we have access, communitarian access, to past historical events. And that is how it now seems to me. For us today, as for King Agrippa of old, it seems to me, it is by events not done in a corner that the gospel makes rightful claims on our ordinary evidential faculties so as to command the attention, the reflection, and the assent of us, his wayward children. It is, of course, a commonplace that on externalist theories like Plantinga's, one can know without knowing that one knows or how one knows. In keeping with this, it is by the spirits working in synergy with these ordinary means, the disciples' perceptions of Jesus, the disciples passing on by means of ordinary testimony uh, what they saw and heard to the early Christians. It is by the spirits working in synergy with these ordinary means, I, su I thus suggest, that Plantinga really knows Jesus.
that'd be fine. Moderate it. Mm -hmm. okay. Thanks, Steve. That was awesome and interesting stuff. Uh, we've got time to do some Q&A before the um, reception, which is downstairs. Uh, after the event, you will just go through the doors to your left and then down a set of stairs that will be on your right after you take the left and there's reception down there. Um, okay, so I like to get questions from undergraduates first, if any are present. Undergrads get a first shot. I see some of my former students out and there. And there's a guy I met on the plane coming in, Cameron, sitting in the back row. Are you serious? Yeah, yeah, I met him on the plane and he's <laughs> just been reading about deism and uh, he's accountant graduate from uh, Baylor. That's and great. And he's just been reading and he's thinking about studying. All right, philosophy. well, do you, you get first shot then. Okay, right here. Yes, uh, in your illustration of the virgin bird, uh, you gave those um, two examples, one where uh, John is kind of by himself and receives inspiration of the Holy Spirit to then uh, write this narrative of the virgin birth. The other one is where he uh, receives a testimony. And, um, we talked about uh, the uh, Holy Spirit interacting with us, or, or uh, the internal witness of the Holy Spirit in that matter. Um, what would you say uh, about the possibility of, um, if one seems to have this internal witness of the Holy Spirit that Jesus was born of the Virgin, um, and you also have, say, uh, you know, the, the creeds, the, the ecumenical creeds that seem to teach this and this has been teaching of the church, but what if upon uh, historical investigation one would come to be skeptical about uh, the historicity of the virgin birth? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So, here here it's important uh, on both models to distinguish between what the model, we've got the, uh, the AC model over here, the Alvinian Calvinian model, and we've got the DC, the doubly Calvinian model here, and I wasn't able to read you the passages from Calvin that show he's really on my side. You'll just have to take my word for that. But for that, you have to go beyond the Institute to Calvin's commentaries. So on either of these models, it's important to distinguish between what I would call the positive grounding of the belief in, in question, and, and they have different accounts of the positive grounding, distinguish that from the sorts of things that could, even with strong positive grounding, uh, count as uh, defeaters, okay? I think of the positive grounding as like uh, what lifts the belief up to the, where it can be, uh, they're like, balloons filled with hydrogen that lift it up, and the defeaters are like sandbags that can drag it back down. So on the, uh, on the Alvinian Calvinian model, what gives the belief its positive grounding would be primarily this inner testimony of the Holy Spirit. Um, Calvinists tend to be pretty individualistic, as do most Protestants. If you're uh, from the Catholic Christian tradition, the teaching of the church, the tradition of the church is also going to play an important role as one of your balloons giving it positive lift. Um, but if we just stick with scripture, uh, uh, that's going to be important. Um, since Planticus model, uh, the, uh, what you, what's plausible to say about how the writer of those birth narratives came to it uh, it doesn't really matter for the positive grounding. Uh, so if you were to learn um, the sort of thing that I described about how John wrote it, um, that itself wouldn't function as a sandbag driving it down. Um, there might be other things you could learn that would serve as sandbags, but I don't see how that would, because it's not built into the positive account at all. Um, on my account, the DC account, uh, part of your positive grounding is at least uh, a plausible presumption that uh, what happened in the first years of Jesus' life or in, during the birth of Jesus 
that there was some testimonial chain that gave the writer of Scripture access to that, and that's been trans transmitted. And so, if you learn the sort of thing I say you learn, uh, that, uh, that I describe, uh, if you had a little diary of John saying how he came to write these narratives, actually they're not in John, but the, uh, the uh, relevant gospel writer, and he described it, um, that would serve as a powerful sandbag. Because part of your confidence regarding specific historical events is on this approach going to depend upon at least the presumption that there is some human chain of testimony that the Holy Spirit is using to give access. Uh, it's not going to be a Joseph Smith sort of writing the Book of Mormon kind of thing, uh, where uh, Joseph Smith is inspired by uh, the Holy Spirit to describe historical events in detail and claims no natural human testimonial access to those events. Okay, right there. I couldn't quite hear the last sentence. If you yes. hold that only God acts to save us, then... Does that necessitate accepting a view that says uh, that there's no sort of inference? The, the, the view you're arguing against? No, I don't think... Uh, um, I don't, I don't see a connection there. Um, the, uh, I think the view that uh, a Calvinist view that strongly places salvation at the initiative of God, uh, and, that, and that can get pretty strong, I don't think that, I don't see how that would place any big constraints on what you thought the normal um, processes or mechanisms are that God would use in um, commuting, communicating to us truths that um, we, we, we don't have access to just by our natural use of our faculties the way we do in physics or chemistry or the like. It seems like there's a, a lot of loose play either way. And, you know, I believe you have to follow up. Speak up, no, speak up right there.
very uh, dramatically, sometimes slowly, to touch our hearts and soften them and bring us to a clearer perception of who we are. And, uh, and those dispositions of the heart uh, strongly will strongly affect uh, how we process whatever evidence we're given on questions that bear directly on the sort of existential choices that are involved in how we live our lives. Um, so um, I think that part of Al's work is very bold and very true. And it can be incorporated into either one. So um, I would certainly hold that um, when I was 17 uh, and uh, in a, uh, my, one of the more rebellious parts of my life, I was, uh, you know, as a matter of the heart, somewhat indisposed to kneel before God. Um, God had to do something in my heart. And even during that summer in 1970, when I began reading that that group, to come to believe God rose Jesus from the dead wasn't just a cognitive change. It required a huge flip-flop at the heart level. And if, I can, if I can briefly say why, I described this at lunch to people. Uh, in my Paul Tillich stage, my Buddhist stage, interpreting the resurrection uh, symbolically, I was quite taken with a little Zen poem that Thomas Merton quotes on the first page of Zen for the Birds of uh, Appetite. And the poem goes this way. Ride your horse along the edge of the sword. Hide yourself in the middle of the flames. Blossoms of the fruit tree will bloom in the fire. The sun rises and you eat. The idea of that poem was if you if you plumb with existential authenticity, the, the darkest, dirtiest, gloomiest parts of life. Oh, I bet on Bob Dylan to the skin cells when I was 50 and 60. <laughs> if, you, if you go for that the authentic, hardest parts of life, you will bring about your own inner resurrection. You'll bring about your rebirth. And that's a very kind of narcissistic approach to the resurrection and to what it means. And to come to believe in a real resurrection, that Jesus actually rose from the dead, and that God the Father rose him from the dead. And that's my only hope, too, that God has to bring me back to life. Uh, it was like pulling a tooth, or maybe a whole set of teeth. Peter Van Inwijk once said to me that to me, I said, well, what was it like becoming a Christian? And he looked at me in that Van Inwijk way, and it wasn't true, he was even going to answer me, and he said, well, it was kind of like going to the dentist and getting your teeth pulled. <laughs> so, <laughs> so when there's, epis, when there's disagreement among epistemic peers uh, on issues that touch our lives so intimately and so, so uh, decisively, uh, there are things that are going to be coloring the spectacles we use to look at evidence. Uh, your, um, great question. We do have time for a few more questions. Steve and then Kelly. Steve Evans. Sorry, see Steve Evans. Thanks for a great talk, Steve. Uh, I'm not fully convinced that you're, in, that you're not an externalist of sorts, too. Um, I mean, just put it this way. Take your family story about your ancestor jumping ship. Um, there's tons of family stories like that. If you have a serious historian and investigate them, they turn out to be just that, stories, myths that got handed down, just like historical facts can be handed down, right? So one might think that what, what might make it the case that you, are, that you know this, or that you warrantedly believe it, would be something like, in this case, they were real facts and they were, it's a reliable chain. Mm -hmm. But those are external facts. They're not necessarily facts that you have any internal access to. In the same way, maybe it's important that someone in the community, taking your communitarian side, has this evidence. But you as a member of the community 
don't really know that this, I mean, you, you, you're not in a position to be able to make a judgment about that because you like the expertise. Yeah, yeah. So it, that might suggest that what's really important is that the belief gets formed in some sort of reliable way, which is mm -hmm. the way an externalist would think about mm -hmm. this. Now, it might very well be that what you're saying is true, that one way that can happen is through ordinary historical mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, chains. Maybe that's the normal way or the most common way. Mm -hmm. But if, if, if what's crucial is just that it happens through some sort of reliable way, maybe the Holy Spirit story would also be, at least for some people, mm -hmm. Yeah, no, thank you. Yeah, thanks so much for bringing that up, Steve. Uh, I mean, the fact is, what makes sensible evidentialism, uh, it's essential to its uh, whatever sensibleness it has, is that it is externalist. That that testimonial chain, what makes it warrant conferring is that it is a it's a chain that's functioning properly in the way it's designed to function in the right sort of environment. Um, and so um, my, my, you know, my picture is that, that um, God designed our beliefs to have, get the warrant and even the rationality they have by, um, b partly by making us social creatures where he's intended us to be forming beliefs through these sorts of testimonial chains. We're, a, we're an organism. <laughs> We're a body, and when it's functioning properly, uh, it's not what we do, it's that this is objectively what's happening that gives it its warrant. So, and I build that in in various places. I didn't mention that in this talk, but you picked up on it right. So to be sensible evidentialists. Now, I, I thinking over this the last few months, I see problems here. Do I? Am I, can, can I bite the necessary bullets to hold on to this? That's another topic. It starts, I start seeing it as um, making me wonder, well, can externalism really be right here? Um, but that's another topic. Yeah, I am trying to, I'm trying to put uh, this evidentialism on an externalist foundation. Yeah. Okay, so Kelvin's going to get the last question, and you can follow up. I know a few other people have questions, but you can do that uh, during reception time. Kelly, you get the last question. Okay. Um, thanks for the talk. So, my question is how you respond to um, how your views um, play into one's choice of church. So, if, our, if part of our warrant for our beliefs in the resurrection, for example, come from a Yeah. Uh, so I want my account to. Um, I want my account to um, intensify that question, not to not to get rid of it. Um, 
I think uh, if we take a rich uh, kind of Plantinga epistemology that beliefs have warrant when they're produced by a belief forming process that's uh, functioning properly in the environment that it's meant to uh, function in, uh, and it's been designed for, we call alethic purposes, for getting the truth, it's design plan as an alethic one. Um, I think part of what's the, the distinctive design plan for human beings that makes us a little bit different from our, our friends, the other animals, is that uh, God has given us uh, 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 an ability um, not just to uh, uh, trust other people's testimony and trust what our senses tell us uh, when they report various things, but also to reflect and monitor the deliverances of these sort of instinctive sources of belief. And when there's uh, glitchy things that happen, to refine them, to learn how to discern. Uh, there's not really a pink rat on the chair next to Trent, because I did take that LSD, seeing if I could really give a talk on LSD. Uh, <laughs> we, learn, we learn to dis discriminate in that way, to monitor and discriminate uh, and uh, I don't think even the best tracking dogs reflect on uh, They discriminate all right, but they don't have that meta capacity. Um, so uh, for us as a community, uh, as a Christian community ecumenically to be functioning properly, there has to be that kind of monitoring. There has to be a certain amount of willingness to, uh, to work through our suspicions to work through the hard questions. Um, I've been reading Bart Ehrman's book on the other Gospels, reading the Acts of Peter, for instance, and uh, they're fascinating documents, and some of them come not so very long after the New Testament uh, writers were working. And the Holland Library, where I get my pleasure reading in Holland, Michigan, the shelves have far more books by Bart Ehrman than they do by N.T. Wright. Um, we need to be in the public arena also helping. This isn't quite bearing on choice of churches, okay? But it's bearing on the need to engage in a culture where suspicion of the, the traditional church in all its branches, uh, suspicion of it is, uh, is rampant. And so there's these sandbags that people are really being, uh, it's making Christianity for so many something that has lost plausibility. Um, and uh, we as Christian thinkers and Christian writers, I was talking with Mike Beatty in his office. Where's Mike sitting anywhere here? Mike, you, that came up, and this is a good chance to plug for that. We need to be working in public media, working in things that are readable, uh, as readable as Anne Lamont, uh, but that engage philosophical issues. I recently read a book, have any of you heard of it, uh, The Woman Who Slept With God? It's fiction, it's a wonderful, a, a wonderful <laughs> book. Um, <laughs> write it down, go read it. <laughs> Okay, that was the last one. And on that. <laughs>